Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. Tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about Matsu. Matsu is uh, one of the early uh, golden age of Chan masters. Uh, he was a student of Nanue Hairang, and he was the teacher to Bai Zhang. And he's known as sort of an iconoclastic, perhaps we could even go so far as to say known as obnoxious from the dialogues that he's credited with. If you read his sermons, however, you get a slightly different take on that. And um, I'd like to just on and off uh, read a little bit of things that are attributed to him. Um, the first one goes like this. A monk asked why the master maintained the mind is Buddha. The master answered, because I want to stop the children from crying. The monk persisted. When the crying has stopped, what is it then? Not mind, not Buddha, was the answer. How do you teach a man who does not uphold either of these? The master said, I would tell him not things. The monk again questioned, if you meet a man free from attachment to all things, what would you tell him? The master replied, I would let him experience the great Tao. When we're free from all those attachments to mind is Buddha, not mind, not Buddha, so on and so forth, we don't need the acknowledgement or validation from a master to go about our business of experiencing the great way, the Dharma, as it were. There are a lot of things that make up a statement like mind is Buddha. And many of them are often misunderstood or can be simplified or overcomplicated. Simplified isn't so bad, but overcomplicated, that's where we run into trouble. For Matsu and any number of the other great masters, what they taught was our true nature, our Buddha nature, not a thing comprises everything. Everything is part of it, and we're making it by our thinking. The Yoga Kara school is known as the mind only school. And the, the idea behind that, and it's in the Lankavatara Sutra also, is that we're creating everything in our mind. Now, there's aspects of that which are easy to wrap our heads around if we consider it for a moment or two. And there's other aspects of it that seemingly just don't ring true. We are in a position now from psychology and other studies that we're pretty on board with the idea that our perception of things is only our perception of things, not necessarily things in and of themselves. And my perception of something and your perception of something, even of the same thing, 
will probably diverge to the point where we would think the other person is nuts for perceiving something that way. However, when we're in a position to consider it more fully, and we can put it in terms of the two truths, there is the conventional truth, the relative truth. This is a microphone, that's a computer keyboard, that's Bell, that's a Moktak, and there you all are on the screen in little tiny unique boxes. That's the relative. That's what I'm seeing right now. I'm smelling the incense. I'm feeling the sort of increasing warmth in the room. I'm seeing you guys. And as far as I'm concerned right now, that's truth. That's the reality that I'm perceiving. Now, obviously, you're looking at a screen also. And what you're seeing on that screen could very well exclude your own picture or maybe not have it in the same place as it is on mine. So my perception of this talk as it's going out on the ether is going to be different from yours. In the absolute, one notch up from the relative, perhaps, maybe not the entire all the way up to the absolute, we could say that despite all those differences in appearance, it's all the same thing. It's just that there's little bits of it that we perceive differently and it doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't separate them from the unity of the Zoom and YouTube broadcast. They're just different. from one of Matsu's sermons. One day the master spoke to the assembly as follows. All of you should realize that your mind is Buddha. That is, this mind is Buddha mind. The great master Bodhidharma came from India to China to transmit the Mahayana Buddhist Dharma, uh, doctrine of the one mind in order to enlighten us all. He used the texts of the Lankavatara Sutra to prove the presence of the mind in all beings. He thought that people might become confused and cease believing that within each of them, this mind is innate. Therefore, he quoted the Lankavatara. Buddha teaches that the mind is the source of all existence and that the method of Dharma is no method. The master continued, those who seek for the truth should realize there is nothing to seek. There is no Buddha but mind, and there is no mind but Buddha. Do not choose what is good nor reject what is evil, but rather be free from purity and defilement. When you realize the emptiness of sin, Thoughts perpetually change and cannot be grasped because they possess no self nature. The triple world is nothing more than one's mind. The multitudinous universe is nothing but the testimony of one Dharma. So if we put that in perspective of the relative and the absolute, the two truths, Our mind, our innate mind, sometimes with a capital M, encompasses everything. It is reality. It's part of reality. Your mind, the Buddha's mind, my mind, all one. Our perceptions of form, 
which are created by our thinking, they'll vary. But innately, we all possess the same Buddha mind. We need to avoid defilement. And for that matter, not attach to, but direct ourselves toward purity without attaching to that. What are seen as forms are the reflection of the mind. The mind does not exist by itself. Its existence is manifested through forms. Whenever you speak about mind, you must realize that the appearance and reality are perfectly interfused without impediment. That is what the achievement of Bodhi is. That, that which is produced by mind is called from form. When you understand that forms are non-existent, then that which is birth is also no birth. If you are aware of this mind, you will dress, eat, and act spontaneously in life as it transpires, and thereby cultivate your spiritual nature. There is nothing more than I can teach you. When it comes down to the two truths and the doctrine of the one mind, I think a lot of times we give the absolute short shrift. We hear about this one with everything aspect, but then we really got to go with the, yeah, but I'm going to sleep in my bed tonight. And you're going to sleep in your bed tonight. And my keyboard isn't your keyboard. And we totally diverge from the unity of all things, the unhindered unity that is inherently there, that's innate, the one mind that is Buddha. A lot of times we'll attach too much to form and not enough, enough to Buddha and the one mind. The way I've, I've been taught it and like to put it myself is that the absolute only manifests through the relative and the relative only manifests through the absolute. They're not two separate things. They're one thing. You can't even say that they're two sides to one coin because there is no side. They're perfectly intertwined with each other without any impediment. So when we hear about things like mind is Buddha, and we hear about the absolute, the unimpeded unity of all things. We don't have to reject it or somehow lessen its value by immediately jumping to yeah, but this is my microphone and that's my keyboard and these are my perceptions, mine, 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 mine. A monk asked the master why he maintained the mind is Buddha. The master answered, because I want to stop the crying children. The monk persisted, when the crying has stopped, what is it then? Not mind, not Buddha, was the answer. How do you teach a man who does not uphold either of these? The master said, I would tell him, not things. The monk again questioned, if you meet a man free from attachment to all things, what would you tell him? The master replied, I would let him experience the great Tao. So my question is, what are you doing? What am I doing to stop the children from crying? 